The English love eccentrics. And one of the types of eccentric to have particularly fascinated English people in the past are misers, men and women, to be honest, they're usually men, who have a natural tendency towards meanness, who prefer to close rather than open their purses. Several misers in the past have become almost minor celebrities among the public due to the extreme measures they have taken to save the pennies while amassing and sitting on large fortunes. Some of the combined traits of various of these men in the public consciousness inspired Charles Dickens to create in 1843 the character of the callous, gruel-eating, penny-pinching misanthrope Ebenezer Scrooge in his novel A Christmas Carol. I think it's becoming a bit of a tradition on this channel for me to share once a year a story of a miser in the run-up to Christmas. But today I give you a double helping as I share with you the story of two celebrity misers from the 18th century. Sir Harvey Elwes, the second baronet of Stoke by Clare in Suffolk, and his nephew, his sister's son, John Meggert Elwes. Their eccentricities were seemingly born, for the most part, from an inherited pathology within the family. The remarkable life story of these two men, of considerable fortune, was well known in the beginning of the 19th century, as John Elwes was the subject of a biography written by a journalist and playwright called Edward Topham, a biography that also outlines the odd habits of his uncle, Sir Harvey. Although Dickens' Ebenezer Scrooge is eventually reformed through his encounter with the various spirits of Christmas past, present and yet to come, Elwes Sr. and Elwes Jr. did not let up on their economy measures, maintaining them until the very end of their lives. Sir Harvey Elwes had inherited his title, a baronetcy, a hereditary knighthood, on the death of his grandfather in 1706, when he was 23. With the title came an estate and a very fine restoration mansion at Stoke by Clare in the Suffolk countryside. The house he dwelled in in Stoke by Clare is known as Stoke College and was a medieval chantry college and is now used as a public school. The inheritance was a bit of a mixed blessing. The estate was heavily mortgaged, it was decayed and there was little cash to sort things out. His maternal uncle, the Earl of Bristol, suggested he sold the estate and cut his losses, but instead Sir Harvey kept it and began then to live frugally. And by the middle of the 18th century, that mode of living had reversed his fortunes entirely. Like many of the men of his social class, he initially went out into the world, and between 1706 and 1722 he was a member of Parliament on the Whig ticket, but after 1722, he returned to Suffolk and never really left again and lived at Stoke College alone with few servants and little society. When he died in 1763, he was possessed of a fortune worth a quarter of a million pounds. He managed to transform his situation by the most stringent economy. He spent barely £100 per annum on his own comfort. He was described at the time as perhaps the most perfect picture of human penury that ever existed. Some of his daily habits certainly influenced the character of Ebenezer Scrooge. He would generally eat but one meal a day, and that would either be game he had shot on his estate or a bowl of gruel. He wouldn't put any wood on his fire until the single log that was burning in the grate was consumed, and in the winter months, he would go to bed at sunset to save both the wood and candles, even though the wood was free and came from his estate. He spent nothing on his own clothing. He wore the clothes of his grandfather, Sir Gervais, that he had found in an old trunk in the house. So he sat in this large house, freezing to death, wearing moth-eaten Carolean clothing. He must have been a remarkable sight. His wealth was legend in the district and it was common knowledge that he kept a large quantity of cash in the house, which given he lived with a small household of staff, 
made him a prey to thieves. He was on one occasion robbed in the middle of the night, and the robbers, having tied up his manservant, got away with over £7,000 in cash from the house. But when they were caught and came to trial, Sir Harvey, very oddly, refused to testify against them, and they got off scot-free. He maintained his life of mortification until the end, bequeathing his fortune to his nephew John Meggett, who promptly adopted the name of Elwes. John Meggett Elwes was the son of Sir Harvey's sister, who had married a very prosperous brewer who had bought for himself a country estate, Marcham Park, in Berkshire. John Meggett Elwes inherited that estate in Berkshire as well as his uncle's fortune, and he was said to be worth close to half a million pounds in the mid-1760s. While Sir Harvey was a bit of a crusty character for the whole of his life, John Elwes seems to have been somewhat better-natured in his younger years. In his youth, he'd been very sociable and gregarious. He was a fine horseman and he had many friends. He only seems to have developed miserly ways in his 40s when he inherited his uncle's fortune. They were ways that became much more pronounced as he grew older. John Meggett Elwes was so gregarious that despite never marrying, he managed to sire two sons out of wedlock, John and George. He seems to have inherited the miserly traits from his uncle, but also from his mother, Sir Harvey's sister, who, though she was possessed of an ample fortune herself, is said to have starved herself to death, believing she was living in extreme poverty. John Elwes spent his years travelling between his various country estates in Suffolk and in Berkshire, and after his election to Parliament in 1772 as a member for Berkshire, he spent much time in London too. His clothes were as ragged as his uncle's, and for many years he sported a periwig that he had found in a muddy rut as he was travelling along a road. His travelling habits in general were a touch bizarre. He would ride along on an old mare very slowly, so that he didn't have to spend too much money feeding the horse with hay. He would always use the back roads, even allowing himself to get filthy crossing ditches to avoid the tolls on the turnpike roads. And he would never stop at inns, and would take as his only sustenance on journeys, journeys that could last a few days, a couple of boiled eggs, which he kept in the pockets of his very tattered old greatcoat. In London, John Meggett Elwes owned a considerable amount of semi-derelict property, and when he was in Parliament, he would sleep on pallets on the floor of whichever of his properties was then vacant. This habit very nearly cost him his life when he and the elderly charwoman he employed to look after his properties caught a fever. The curious pair were found after the property was broken into by his nephew, the charwoman dead, and Elwes close to expiring too. Again, rather like his uncle, he had both a regard and a disregard for money. Although wearing ragged clothing, eating boiled eggs and sporting a beggar's wig, he was known to have lent money to lots of members of Parliament, often bankrolling their lavish lifestyles, with no expectation of any return of what he was owed. Towards the end of his life, John Meggett Elwes started to hoard small quantities of cash in various places, and he would move around from place to place checking that they were still there. Like his mother, he began to develop a deep pathological fear that he would die in poverty, and often he would be heard by his servants having nightmares in which he was seemingly being attacked by robbers. He was very robust in his physical health, but sadly the continual anxiety of living like this wore him out. When he died in 1789, at the age of 75, his fortune of £800,000 was divided between his illegitimate sons John and George. Marcham Park in Berkshire went to Elwes' son George and it remained with his descendants until 1948 when, as Denman College, 
it became the College of the Women's Institute. It's a tragic story, really. Elwes' miserliness, like that of his mother and uncle, was turned inward on himself. It was a form of curious self-mortification, born out of a pathological anxiety of the effects of poverty and destitution. Thanks for watching. Thank you.